Looking to get that perfect finish in all your 3D prints? Well, I've got it for you in today's video, so come check it out. Back at it again guys, DW Darkwing Dead, bringing you a highly anticipated video. And it's time to show some wet sanding. So wet sanding, why do we do it? The honest truth is just to reduce and remove what's called orange peel. Now orange peel is something that you've probably heard uh, talked about in a lot of the groups and there's a lot of old wives tales. You can paint without getting it, this and that, blah, blah, blah. I am going to have another video that really digs in deep to how to reduce orange peel, um, certain techniques, certain methods, certain prep ways where you can limit it to not 100%. You can still get some pretty clean uh, results uh, out of it. The reality is, is no matter if you're using an HVLP gun, uh, water-based paint, uh, airbrush, aerosol, you are going to get orange peel to a certain degree. So the reason why we wet sand is to remove that. So long and the short, that's exactly what orange peel is, is Paint has solvents and within the curing process, it shrinks and you get orange peel. There's many factors, humidity, uh, the amount of wait time in between paint, the type of paint. Like I said, that's going to be another video for another time, but you are going to have orange peel to some degree in every single type of painting that you do. You can go to the most expensive dealership, get the most expensive car, McLaren, whatever. It's going to have some form of orange peel in it. It's just texturing that happens in the paint as it dries and cures over time. So this video is going to basically explain my process and how to properly wet sand and also refine. The process that I do, it basically completely smooths out that orange peel uh, with proper sanding and doing what I call pyramiding, going to a higher, higher, and the highest grit sandpaper you can get. And then buffing, polishing, and refining it to a crystal clear showroom finish. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna move out to my garage where I have the helmet set up. I'm gonna be showing you what my paint job looked like with no wet sanding whatsoever, small sections where I had already wet sanded to show you that difference. And then I'm actually gonna go through the whole process of wet sanding, buffing, polishing, refining. So let's move on out there and check it out. All right guys, so we're out here, uh, out in the dungeon. It's probably gonna get a little bit sweaty, so I swap shirts. So wet sanding, um, you know, why do we wet sand? So before we get into actually demonstrating the wet sanding, buffing, and refining um, of the Vader helmet. What I want to do is just explain a little bit about orange peel, uh, why it happens, and why it is I do what I do. Basically, what orange peel is, is it is a texturizing of the paint. It can happen on the base coat, and it can also happen on the clear coat. Now, in paint, there are what are called solvents, and long and the short, solvents basically help dissolve other things. Without them, paint wouldn't dry, it wouldn't cure. But there's a big difference between drying and curing. Drying, it feels dry to the touch. Curing takes longer, and that's when orange peel really happens. If you've ever painted anything, you'll probably notice that when you paint it, uh, when you first put it on, it looks super smooth, you get super hyped, and then you come back, you know, an hour or two later, and then you notice all of this um, graininess to the paint. And essentially when paint cures, it shrinks. So when the paint shrinks, that's when orange peel happens. Inevitably, orange peel will always happen to some degree. There are definitely things that factor into it, why it happens more than others. A lot of it is prep, primers put on too heavy. Same thing with paint. If you put too many coats of the paint on, you don't give it long enough time to cure. Airborne humidity, temperature, these are all things that factor into orange peel. It's very hard to get all of those things completely perfect. And that's why, you know, when people paint cars and whatnot, they invest thousands into these state-of-the-art facilities that have humidity control, temperature control. Uh, they have special HVLP guns. These are all things that you need to get as minimal as orange peel as possible. But understand, even with all those, there is still orange peel to a certain degree. But to a certain degree is, is very selective. Um, you know, if you use something like aerosol, you're just naturally going to get a lot more orange peel than if you're using an HVLP gun because the amount of PSI that you're using also factors into orange peel. Most of us in 3D printing do use basic aerosol. Um, some of us use airbrush and things like that. Again, it's very technical. I'm gonna have another video that really digs deep into how to reduce orange peel as much as you can. I just wanted to touch on it a little bit because understand, um, I don't want you guys getting frustrated and painting something saying, God, why am I getting all this orange peel? I have to wet sand. 
orange peel will always happen to a certain degree. Uh, that other video that I have will, sh will show and give you examples of how to limit it as best as possible. But today on this helmet here, I just wanna show you how to reduce it the proper way and why we do it. Even in the best setups, you still will deal with orange peel a little bit. And this is a great way how to reduce it to get those prints clean and pristine looking. So now that we've kind of covered, you know, what orange peel is, what you wanna do is get rid of those ripples. So when you have orange peel, your paint, it's, it's kind of bumpy, okay? It's got kind of like ridges like this. And essentially what we're doing is we we are using a solute, we're using water, um, and we're putting it on the surface, which it's creating some separation, and we're lightly going over it with a high grit sandpaper to reduce it. Think of it the same way as you would be sanding PLA with say 180 or 220, but we're basically reducing the amount of friction because we don't want to completely strip the clear coat off. We basically just wanna take this top layer of ridges out so that when we're done, it's more flat because when it's flat it's got better re reflectivity it has better gloss better depth it looks way better overall we'll leave your print looking something like this very crisp very defined just you can see how the light hits it and it's just it's just crisp the gloss like i said it's got great reflectivity because when the light hits it it's hitting a flat smooth surface versus a bumpy so it reflects versus refracts so the print is just going to look absolutely ridiculous and on this dome piece you're going to be able to tell it's going to be night and day difference from something that's not wet sanded versus something that is wet sanded so now that i've explained that to you let me show you some pictures of basically what my orange peel looks like and show you some examples of it wet sanded and buffed and refined and then actually show you how to do the whole process um you know this piece is all it's it's been painted uh, it's been clear coated. Um, I did use an HVLP gun. However, I was dealing with a lot of humidity. So I don't shy anything away from my channel. All this and it's super easy and blah, blah, blah. No, it's a lot of work. And that's another part of this video is I want to show you what actually goes into getting, you know, prints to look like this. There's a lot of transparency with me. I'm very upfront and honest. I had about two weeks of rain and it heavily affected uh, what was going on. I knew I was going to wet sand this, so I wasn't super, super worried about it. Um, but I just wanted to show you guys basically what my orange peel kind of looks like. So there are some areas that did look better than others. And whenever you're doing wet sanding, you really want to make sure you have some sort of overhead light or maybe like a flashlight or something on hand, just so you can actually see um, the difference. This side here, and hopefully you can see how clean and refined this light is here. This, you can see that it's perfectly round and it's been wet sanded and buffed. And I still need to do some polishing because I have, I have some light scratches in there. But now look at it compared to this. It's a perfect example. So is this acceptable orange peel to, to many? Yes, they're like, yeah, it, it, it looks okay. But when you look at the, look at the, the night and day difference, you can actually see the individual LEDs on the flashlight. And when you come over here, it's just all, it's all distorted, okay? So that's what most people's, you know, paint jobs are going to look like. Now, if I waited and maybe didn't have as much humidity, could this have looked better? Absolutely. But again, I don't shy away from what I do because mistakes happen. And sometimes you, I'm on a pinch to get this done. And I knew I was going to what's in it. So I said, eh, just forget it. I'm going to do it. It's going to make you know, great for the video. Right here, look how much cleaner and crisper that is. And if you go down, you can even see like right here wasn't wet sanded. And here it was. That's a big difference just in clarity and it will make your prints, you know, look that much better. But like I said, a lot of people, you know, from looking at this right now, they're like, man, that looks amazing, but I'm OCD and I want it to look as best as I can. So that's what you're dealing with, with, you know, factory orange peel versus, you know, orange peel being fully removed and refined. Great example is kind of right here. Like I said, with looking at how clean and crisp this light is. I mean, you can even see the texture on my ceiling. It's just not as defined. You can see all those bumps in the print, and it really does make a huge difference. What I'm gonna do here is kind of show you my process. I'm not going to do the whole helmet. Key things, guys, is make sure you have good light. If you don't have some sort of handheld light because you wanna be able to kind of scan your area and especially, you know, make sure you get, you're getting rid of those scratches because that's a big thing with this is you, you are scratching this all up. So you really do have to polish it and refine it and spend some time polishing it down. But it, it's, it's really worth it because when you do this wet sanding, 
you'll never get paint to look the way it looks after it's wet sanded buffed and refined you know what i mean so that's really a huge thing so i'm going to do the other set uh the other half of the dome here now when you're doing this i do recommend you know doing some having it on some sort of table you are going to have to hold the piece you are going to have to kind of maneuver around what we're going to do we're just going to do this small section right here when you do wet sanding if you are not well versed in it always remember this take the least aggressive method possible pick up some some high grit sandpaper if you've done this in the past and you're comfortable with it you can of course start at 1000 or 1500 this is your first time maybe on a practice print or something like that, which I do recommend if you ever have failed prints or something, sand them, prime them, paint them, clear coat them, and practice on them, okay, until you get comfortable. Don't just jump into doing Vader. It takes time. You, you have to learn how the machine works and, and learn the whole process. But when you wet sand, you don't really want to skip step. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be doing 1,000, uh, 2,000, 3,000, and 5,000. So I'm doing all the proper steps. You would never want to like start at 1,000 and then jump up to like 3,000 or like 1,000 to, you know, you want to, it's the same way as if you're sanding PLA, you would never want to start off at 60 and then jump up to 320. You want to have an interval in between. So um, I'm going to be using four different intervals here, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and 5,000. I'm going to show you guys my whole process. So um, let me get my sandpaper out here. And then what we also have here is I just, I'm going to have a small piece of 3000 grit. It's basically off of this big 3M foam trizat piece. And I also have some small pieces of 5000. This is doing as we're pyramiding up. So when you do something like a thousand grit, you're going to put very fine scratches in. And then the 2000 grit is going to help take those off. The 3000 is going to, you know, further along progress that process and then the 5000 is going to almost polish it to a certain degree by not skipping any steps we are going to save time with the buffing and polishing all while helping reduce that texturizing that has happened uh in the finish from the uh from the orange peel you're going to want to have a bottle of water and this is very important because you're going to want to keep a good amount of lubricity on the surface now when you sand there's two ways I recommend doing it. Getting some sort of a foam pad that you can fold over because you don't want to just use the contour of your head and you want to have some kind of interface. So what always works great is uh, when you're doing a dome anyways, is something that is bendable and squishy like a, a piece of foam or you can even use an old wallet. Either one will work absolutely great. I don't recommend doing, especially on domes, is using something like a thick foam pad. Um, yes, it contours, but it being naturally, it's still sturdy. So you going over this uh, a rounded surface on something flat you could create too much surface tension you could take more paint off than you want to so i don't really recommend using a foam pad like this this is great for just you know straight edges however for domes and really intricate areas i don't recommend a foam block like that so what i'm going to do here is i've got a fresh piece of a thousand what i actually like to do is just kind of knock it down a little bit just by taking my hand and just reducing it a little bit because it's it's when it's when it's fresh it's got a little bit more bite to it so we don't want too much bite but we want enough so just take your hand and just kind of wear it down kind of like this i'm just going to hold it like this you want to take your water um, and basically spray it on the area through here is i actually like to hold mine but if you want to do it on the table you can um so you have your paper folded over and you're just gonna wanna support the piece and you don't wanna really put a lot of pressure on it. You just wanna kinda glide over left to right. Really important that you kinda have a feel for the sandpaper. So what I did is I actually cut this in half because um, it was just a little bit too big and I, it was just folded over too much and I felt like I couldn't really feel the sandpaper not stacked up as much there's still that foam in between re-lubricate this here and it's just it just feels a lot better like i can feel the sandpaper i can actually feel the grittiness and that's one thing you're gonna you're gonna notice when you start wet sanding this is it's gonna be just a little bit gritty and we want to knock that grit down so when you're going over this and you feel that grittiness and you feel it to start going away that's a very good sign, okay? You don't wanna put a lot of pressure. It's, it's just not needed. It's not like when you're sanding PLA and you wanna dig in. If you wanna knock down the orange peel faster, decrease the pressure that you're putting on the piece. So decrease your hand pressure and increase your hand speed. 
want to put a lot of pressure on this because you don't want to gouge the paint. You want to kind of change your angles to a certain degree because when you get certain angles, different angles, I should say, you're going to be able to knock down the orange peel in a more efficient way. So always go left to right, top to bottom, and then go top to bottom, right to left. Now, if you've got little crevices in here, just be very, very careful. You don't want to go too hard. Uh, again, it's really just based on your expectations. Once you start seeing this get this kind of milky buildup, um, you're going to want to wipe it away. You don't want too much of that because it's taking off, you know, some of the clear coat, uh, which may have a little bit of grittiness and you could potentially scratch it, which you can get rid of, but if you don't want to create more work for yourself. Right? So we've done this section here, just very lightly with a thousand. And you don't need to go super heavy when you first start off with your heavy grit because it's going to take it off the fastest. So you really, your, your first heavy grit, you're going to use in the shortest time span, okay? But we can see here when we've wet sanded, we can see how we're, you can, that, that, that texturizing comes out and you can see how it was here and here, but now it's all gone. And that's what we want so this is super super smooth already just with a thousand very important when you plan on doing wet sanding make sure you do at least like four coats of clear this has six so i really went heavy on this because i knew i was going to do a good amount of wet sanding you would never want to wet sand just doing one or two coats of clear do at least four coats just have patience start off light take that least aggressive method if you don't want to start off with a thousand start off with two thousand and just kind of slowly teeter yourself up. But now we're gonna jump into doing uh, 2000. So same thing, I'm just gonna kind of work this off a little bit with my hand and I'm gonna lubricate the area and basically repeat the process. Very low pressure. You can spend a little bit more time with 2000, but we still wanna make sure that we do this um, adequately um, because we wanna to try to knock down all of those deeper scratches that the 1000 sandpaper has introduced. So I'm gonna go over this very thoroughly doing the same process, left to right, top to bottom, and then top to bottom, right to left. So now this is with 2000 and it's even smoother. And like I said, 2000 is a great number to start at. If you're not comfortable with starting off at 1000 or 1500, there is nothing wrong with starting off at 2000. Spend a little bit more time doing it that starting off with 1000 just speeds the process up. Once you get comfortable with it, you will learn your method and your way and your safe zone over time. You're starting off, there's nothing wrong with starting off with 2000. It's still a great one to start off with. What we're gonna do is I'm actually just gonna take this 3000 grit right here and I'm gonna spray it on and I'm gonna repeat this process here. And 3000, you really get into where it's, it's, it's pretty high grit. So um, you'd really have to sit here and hit this for a long, long time to burn through the paint. Still don't want to spend too much time because you have to understand that you are taking off a small layer of the clear coat. And when we buff and polish, we are doing that as well. So we don't want to go crazy and spend loads and loads and loads and loads of time sanding this. Uh, we just want to make sure that we thoroughly and adequately go over it. Uh, hitting all the coverage areas that we've sanded with prior grits and it's super super smooth i can feel that there's no grit there's no uh, bite back and you can really see that there's not as much of that milky substance on there because we're really not taking off uh, a ton of the clear coat we're really just kind of smoothing it out that way we're not leaving any deep scratches or any imperfections in the paint when we go ahead and buff and polish it looking at that 3000 grit area sanded and it's getting smoother and smoother you can see that there's no texture really getting it ready for polish now this in theory uh, if you wanted to you could go ahead and get into buffing and polishing it and refining it um, however I am gonna hit it one more time here with my little mini 5000 grit piece and that's just because I'm a little bit OCD uh, there's there's nothing wrong with doing this with 5000 grit, is it absolutely necessary? No, um, you know, 3000 is very smooth and it's probably gonna leave your surface prepped and adequately ready um, to buff and polish. Um, but I just like to do this with the 5000 because it's just so fine. Um, leave the surface just, you'll see how actually how shiny it is just doing it by hand. With the 3000 grit and the 5000 grit, that's really what I'm gonna do in all these crevices here. I don't recommend getting you know the 1000 in here too much in any kind of crease or crevice. 
all in this helmet here where it's got these crevices in here. I'm just going to be hitting that with the 3000 and the 5000. It will work. Yes, I'm going to have to spend a little bit more time, but if I get a gouge or a scratch somewhere in here, it's going to take forever to get out. So crevices, nooks and crannies, very intricate areas. Uh, less is more. I would just spend a little bit more time with a higher grit sandpaper versus trying to get a heavy sandpaper in there and then potentially doing damage that's irreversible. The 5000, it almost starts polishing it to a certain degree. You can actually see how it's added more shine. Um, but there is haziness there, and obviously you wouldn't want to leave your print looking like this. So um, what we're going to do now is we are going to buff, polish, and refine this piece. What we want to do is we want to start off with a compound. Um, there's a lot of different compounds you can use. I like using um, Gion products, G-Y-E-O-N. Uh, so what I'm using is a Gion compound, and I'm going to be using Gion polish. We're going to be using four different pads. You need to use four pads. No, you could probably knock it down with three. But we're going to start off with technically what's called buffing. So we're going to use a wool pad, and we're going to use a heavy compound, and we're going to buff it. Now, buffing is the most aggressive method. It would be very similar to starting off with, um, you know, like 80 or 120 grit just on a higher level. So understand that when you buff, it's going to get rid of some of these deep scratches and these deep, deep, deep defects really quick, but it's going to leave minor blemishes behind. So just the same way that thousand grit sandpaper that we, when we used, it knocked down the orange peel very fast. However, it left superficial defects in the paint that we had to go over with the 2000, the 3000, the 5000. Same idea here. This is gonna help get rid of some of those deeper defects, but then we're gonna to have to use other methods of different pads and different polishes to help reduce the defects that this put in. You wanna just basically take your pad and you wanna put some compound on there. Using a drill polishing adapter, I will leave the link in the description. You know, this wool pad, we've got a medium cut pad, we have a polishing pad and we have a finishing pad. So we're gonna use all four of these in this process. I'll leave some links for you guys. So if you're trying to get a similar setup, you can just buy individual pads. Basically what we wanna do is spread this out. Now, you definitely want to support whatever you're polishing by hand. You wouldn't wanna just leave this on the table. So I'm actually gonna be holding this and doing this with one hand. You really wanna support the model. Um, so the best place for me to support this is gonna be underneath with my hand inside and holding it. Do is just kind of support it with your hand, engage the drill, and just kind of go over the area. The reason I like these pads is because you can kind of get it on the side and it's nice and fluffy. Um, in the past, I've shown other pads like this and these work okay, but you don't really have that side piece. So what happens is you're forced putting pressure on the helmet and this will just keep spinning. I mean, this is, you know, this is what's called rotary basically. So if you put too much pressure and it's spinning, it could grab and pull the helmet. When you're able to do this on the side. You're reducing the amount of surface tension and you can control it a little bit more. So you can still hit it from the front. Just kind of like get it on the side there and you're controlling how much induced force that you have and it's still buffing you down so i really like using these pads especially if you're using a drill it's just going to be way it's going to give you way more control so one very important thing that when you are polishing especially with a drill is you are generating heat, okay? So you want to make sure you are keeping that pad moving. You do not want to sit there and hold it in one spot because you will burn through the paint. The heat is generated and it just takes the paint right off. So you definitely don't want to do that. It is look how much cleaner that is already. Now, it's hazy and it's gonna be hazy. It doesn't look anything like this because we haven't polished it yet. All we've done is buff it and kind of get rid of some of those scratches and there's still a little bit of compound on there so let me try to get that out so you can see that a little bit better compound is going to stick to the surface a little bit more so it's going to be a little bit more hazy um but it's also going to be hazy because like i said it's just buffed so it's, there's still going to be that haze to it so it's not going to be crystal clear whatsoever we can still see see how it's just not there's just that light haze there and that'll come out with with polishing 
So I don't know if you can see, it is definitely cleaner and crisper, you know, compared to some of the stuff down here. A Little bit crisper, but we're really not gonna see a big difference until we actually start polishing. There's a ton of haze in there um, because that's just what buffing does. A wool pad is very abrasive. It's brought the gloss back, but now we have to bring the clarity back and that's what the polishing is gonna do. We're gonna move on to using our medium polishing pad and we're gonna use that same compound because we still wanna do a little bit of cutting just not quite as much as we did with the wool pad. So we are going from a heavy, heavy pad to a medium foam pad. So you're gonna actually see how much more the clarity is restored after doing this. You won't be able to do that side action with the foam pad all that much. It's gonna have to be mostly flat. So this is where you may have to get kind of tricky and hold the model and things like that. Basically, we wanna do the same thing. We're just gonna spread this out and take our time and just polish this down. Most important thing is you want to let the pad spin. Do not put a ton of pressure on. Let the pad spin. When you allow the pad to spin, you're letting it do its job. You don't want it super light to where it's not touching it at all, but you don't want it super heavy to where you're pushing down hard on it. It's going to generate a ton of heat, and again, you're going to burn that paint. You want to find that happy medium where there's just a little bit of friction between the pad and the surface. You can still move it freely, and when you get it right in this general area of distance from the model and the right speed it's going to knock down all those defects and start making it a lot more cleaner and crisper just like when we jumped up from that 1000 grit sandpaper to that 2000 grit sandpaper you want to spend a little bit more time with that foam pad other towel here it's always good to have two towels um newer ones um just because sometimes you'll get residual oils and things like that and they'll smear around and if you're not familiar with it it may you may be like oh why are these streaks in here why is the smudginess in here yada yada so two towel method I always recommend it look how much cleaner that is now just from doing one single stage of polishing obviously i'm going to do more and we can see we've got a little bit of compound uh in the in the corner here that is a very important thing with this is when you wet sand and polish, you may not knock it down in the first try. You may have to repeat the process over or one of the processes over, you know, one or two additional times. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's not a race, you know, um, to do it right. It does take time. So what's the right way to do this and, and why I do it. So you can already see the clarity. It's, it's already there, you know, versus, you know, if we move up to the front here, let me, you know, look how distorted that looks. And then look how clean that looks. Let me try light in the garage so you can see how distorted that looks. And then rotate this over. And look how clean that is. Just from what's saying that. And again with the flashlight. You can see how clean all that looks. Rotate down here. See all that orange peel? We don't want that. We won't get rid of all that. So that is exactly what wet sanding will do and why I do it. Now, it does look pretty clean. Um, however, there are still some very light scratches. So what I do is I go on to the refining, the polishing and the refining aspect. So what I do is I then use a very light polish and you can actually see on this bottle here, it says it's got less cut and it's got higher finish and that's what we want. What I'm gonna do now is I'm basically just going to take this Gion polish and this is where the fun part comes in. This is where you're basically just smoothing everything out. We're just trying to reduce any light scratches or swirls that might be in the surface. We already know we bought the we brought the gloss and the clarity back. Um, now we're really just we're, we're we're jeweling this up like a diamond. So same as before. I'm just gonna spread this out here and just work on this little area and just do this nice polishing here. Look at how beautiful that looks. 
And usually what I'll do is I'll go through this whole model. There is some lint on it. Don't think that those are scratches, but what I like to do before I go to my finishing polish is I will go through and see if there's any scratches and I'll just spend time with this, uh, with, with your polishing pad. Um, and it, it, it usually knocks them down. If it's a deep, deep scratch, um, you know, that's going to be something where you're going to have to go back to probably the wool pad, but there's really not many defects here. This is just some lint that you're seeing from the towel. Good. You know, it's really clean. Now, could you stop right here? Absolutely. You don't necessarily need to go to this black pad. Um, there's no haze. There's no swirls. There's no defects in, but me being me, I'm going to do the black pad. So you could knock this down to what's called a three-step where you start with the wool, go to the medium cut, and then either use the polishing, or you could potentially even jump and just use these three right here. It's a piece for somebody, so I'm really trying to give them my best efforts and my best work. Um, it doesn't really take that much longer to do this uh, finishing polish. Um, it's what I did on the um, Vader, uh, on the, the headpiece right there. So that got a four step. So I'm just gonna do that same four step um on here dude i just inspected it i didn't really see um any scratches um so i'm just going to basically jewel this here get it extra crispy extra glossy and then i'll show you guys the end result you guys see this can you see me sweating I told you I was gonna get sweaty. It was the final stage of the polishing. I'll have you guys check this out. They left some comments on the other one because I was doing the gold faceplate that they really couldn't tell the difference. So like I said, I was waiting to get the right piece to actually show you on a black helmet and boom, here we go. So this really will show you leaning over and look how crisp that is. Absolutely beautiful. So it looks, well, this side's got some schmutz on it for me. Sometimes it's good too to wipe it down with isopropyl alcohol. Just be very careful. Don't rub it too hard or scrub it or anything like that because then you'll get, uh, you know, you'll get some scratches or something in there. But um, you can see, I mean, there's some minor lint on here. Got to get a better towel, but you get the general gist. You see how clean and crisp that is versus how, you know, distorted that front is so that is why we wet sand anyways that's why i wet sand because i try to put my best work forward and if you're really trying to get you know clean crisp prints um you know you can reduce orange peel to a certain degree but you're not going to get rid of it completely like this you're not going to get that mirror finish without wet sanding and uh you know buffing polishing and refining so um now you can do this method uh, with a polisher obviously not this polisher but it would be a similar a similar polisher what's called a dual action it's a little bit bigger i use it in my other videos it's a three inch head um you know the only downside to this is i feel like you don't have as much control with the drill i just on certain pieces you just you have good control with one hand and kind of holding it like this and you just don't have as much control um i'm gonna do this whole piece here with my drill. Um, I did the whole Vader front piece with my drill. It just actually allowed me to get a lot more control. There are some pieces that I have used the dual action polisher, but really the drill, I mean, you know, a hundred dollar drill is a lot more um, affordable than say a $300 polisher. Simple drill with a uh, polishing adapter, a couple pads, uh, some compounds, some polish obviously, and your sandpaper. Most of this stuff um, even if you don't get the Gion products, you can go to Walmart and get all of this stuff. So um, I will leave links in the description of all the products I used. Uh, hopefully this video helped you. Hopefully it gave you a better idea and understanding of not just wet sanding, um, but why we get orange peel, you know, why it happens, um, how we can reduce it. I will have that other video that actually explains it more on a scientific level. Yeah, like I said, that's, uh, that's essentially what we're going for. Uh, that nice, crispy, mint, glossy look. And that's what you'll get with uh, when you when you wet sand and do exactly what I did here today. So I'm going to go inside and cool off and I'll give you my final thoughts on everything.
All right, guys. Well, that's it. That is a wrap on the wet sanding video. Uh, hopefully this video was a little bit more informative and answered maybe more of the questions that you might have had. Again, very thorough. I try to give you guys as much knowledge as I can. The dome completely finished. Uh, you will get a lot more pics and video. You can see my fan spinning. <laughs> Uh, you'll get a lot more pictures of this, a lot more in-depth content uh, in the Vader Part 3. I'm also going to be compiling a wet sanding best practices video. And basically what that is is some footage that uh, I didn't use from this video that I shot and then from the Vader Part 3. Uh, any and all recommended products that I have used or did use in the video, I will leave links in the description. Just an FYI, I am an Amazon affiliate. All the links that I leave, um, I do get a small kickback from. So if you are looking to continue to support me and support the channel, I do appreciate that. So any link that's in the description, if you click and buy there, I do get a small kickback and I do really appreciate that, guys. But all the products I will list, um, you can get a lot of these products from you know AutoZone, uh, Walmart, so if you don't want to wait, hey, I totally get it. A lot of these things you can go to Walmart uh, and get locally uh, at your uh, automotive store. Uh, and if you guys obviously have questions on, hey, where can I get this locally? I want to get this done today. Just drop me a comment. Uh, if you're not on the Discord, join that. Leave me a message on there. And of course, I'll be more than happy to point you guys in the right direction. But that's pretty much it, guys. I hope you guys did enjoy the video. I hope it was informative. Uh, if you are a subscriber to the channel, Thank you, thank you so much. I do appreciate your support. As the channel continues to grow, you're gonna get more and more videos like this. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, drop me one on the uh, video here. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Uh, if you're not a subscriber and you like the content you see and you wanna see even more content, there will be more. So click that subscribe button. I got a lot, lot more coming your way. Vader part three and that wet sanding best practices video will be the next two videos up. So be on the lookout for those. That's it guys. Let me know what you think. Leave me a comment. Give me a thumbs up. I'll talk to you on the discord. I'll talk to you on the comments on the video. Until next time, DW out later.